Hello, and welcome to our quarterly podcast on financial transactions and transfer pricing. During this podcast, we have a discussion with specialists of our PwC network on new developments on transfer pricing. And today we will look back on how financial markets uh, moved this year and what we can expect going forward, uh, as well as we can expect from tax authorities in the next year. And I'm pleased to propose our panel. We have Hirol Mystery from PwC Australia. We have Bob Ritter from PwC US, Dan Pibus from PwC UK. So Hero, it's the first time you join us in the podcast, so I want to give you a, a warm welcome. And I'm David Ledeur of PwC Belgium. So if we kick off, um, we have seen inflation suddenly popping up in, in many parts of the world uh, and uh, central banks reacting on this. Uh, we also observe very volatile markets. So Hero, can you give uh, a view on what happened in uh, Asia Pacific? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, that, that's certainly been probably the most prevalent trend that we've seen play out within the Asia Pacific market is really a persistent increase in inflation throughout the region, with some notable exceptions, probably China being one of them. And what that, that has really meant if we turn to sort of the debt and capital markets has been really a twofold impact of that inflationary pressure. Um, the first and probably the most obvious has just been a continued increase in interest rates throughout the region, which we expect will continue at least across the next quarter of 2023. And so as an example, if I look back in my uh, backyard in, in Australia, we've seen base rates increase 3% in the last nine months from historic lows, with similar trends in India, Singapore and Taiwan and other key jurisdictions in the region. The other interesting sort of impact of inflation, as well as that the increasing interest rate environment, has just been the impact that has had on the cost structures and, and lending practices within the region. So while we're still seeing liquidity in the markets and sort of seeing strong comparables when we look to do our transfer pricing analyses, we are seeing increased tightening of lending practices in the region with, I guess, lenders in the markets being much more selective around where they're allocating capital and increased pressure around both the assessment of the, the credit rating of, of borrowers in the region, as well as just the impact that the cost pressures and increased interest rates has had on the ability of borrowers in the markets to maintain compliance with their key financial covenants. And so I think if, if we think about what that means from a transfer pricing perspective, is there is an increased need to sort of focus on making sure that we're aligning the, sort of the key terms and conditions of intercompany financing arrangements with what we're seeing in the markets and thinking through the impact of both sort of impacts on, on group credit ratings as well as sort of the standalone credit rating of, of borrowers in the market in light of the increased uncertainty and increased costs that we're seeing in the market. Fair point. So it's not only about interest rates going up, but also impact on credit ratings and, and the like. And maybe in some industries more than, than others. Bob, if you go to the US, do you observe something similar? Yeah, David, I think it's a consistent theme. Um, you know, if you look at sort of just the change in the market over the past year, you know, we see the same thing. You know, inflationary pressures, I think, have come down, but um, in the latest we've seen, it has not come down as quickly as I know the Fed would like. So, you know, if you kind of look at the overnight rate um, for SOFR, it's at 4.5% today, uh, up from basically zero, next to zero last year at this time. And the current indication is the Fed is going to continue to increase rates slightly. You know, it's probably going to be smaller increases at 25 basis points, but it's it's been the you know the, the biggest increase you know I think in a short period of time that we've ever seen, uh, in at least our recent time. So the other thing I would note is you know I think we have seen a lot of companies sort of you know being cautious of GNA spend, and you know I think we've we heard about it in 22, but I think we're starting to see more of it in 23, but. Um, you know, we, we keep seeing the recession yet to come. So I think everything you've heard for the last year is there's a recession coming and it's always six months out. And, you know, everything on the U.S. side at least is, you know, we still have strong employment numbers. We still have, uh, you know, very strong sort of spending numbers. And so, you know, I think we kind of keep seeing that there potentially may be a recession coming, but I don't think we see it looming. Um, other, other things, you know, kind of in a different light is just in the, you know, 163J, the interest limitation. That is now that it's sort of gone from EBITDA to EBIT, um, coupled with you know the higher interest rates are definitely putting pressure on interest limitations as you know companies are battling maybe you know, lower profits and tighter restrictions with higher rates. So I know that's a, a trend that's definitely you know, becoming uh, an issue here in the U.S. And then I think maybe just the last thing overall is you know the overall trend, and I know the whole 
change from LIBOR seems like a long ways away for many currencies, but the U.S. had a bit of a reprieve. And so just more of a reminder for people. And, you know, it kind of didn't have a lot of conversations with companies for a little while, but they're coming back up again um, where they had debt that was still on LIBOR and sort of, sort of working through the transition because there were various uh, bases that, you know, were able to to kind of persist with LIBOR through June 2023. And so making sure that companies are looking at that and if there's any sort of existing transactions that are out there um, that they need to then make sure that they're making that transition, you know, in the next few months. So those are some of the, I think, the major just kind of trends and in, in, in things that are happening here on the on the U.S. and America's front. Okay. I heard you saying the super uh, went up to 4.5%, the overnight rate. I remember discussions like two or three years ago, what to do with negative overnight rates. So I think that period is uh, behind us and will likely uh, stay behind us for a very, very long time. Um, yeah. Also, what you mentioned, uh, 163J rules. Uh, so you have a double impact. You go from uh, EBITDA to EBITS on the one hand, and on the other hand, interest rates are uh, increasing, sure, hit twice, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And also you referred to, to SOFR. Uh, we already had some discussions on the transition be between the library rates and the, the, the uh, new reference rates. Uh, my experience at SOFR started to be very well uh, adopted by the market and, and we see market practitioners uh, referring to, to SOFR a lot. Yeah, I think one thing, David, and, you know, I think that, that is a good thing to note is I know there was questions sort of last year, you know, of trying to kind of price it out with, you know, the data points. And so now, you know, we've had SOFR, you know, for, you know, a year, and you saw very quickly the transition, you know, for, for the market over to SOFR at the time. And so I think we've got, you know, rich data points to, for, for, you know, pricing uh, using SOFR these days too. So I know that was sort of an issue last year that, you know, is, is really not a problem anymore. And, and adoption of term SOFR uh, very quickly happened. Um, so, so that's uh, something that people can rely on. Okay, great. Thanks, Bob. Then if we go to you, uh, so we have seen uh, the markets uh, changing a lot, uh, a kind of, it's not very different in, in Europe compared to what uh, Hero and, and Bob were saying. Uh, what are the, the main transfer pricing implications of these changing market conditions? Yeah, that, well, that's right, David. I think just to touch on that European lens, um, it's a very similar picture. Um, you know, rising ECB rates to try and curtail 8% um, inflation right now with a target of 2%. So very, very similar story. Um, if, we, if we focus on rates for a second, I mean, this is an area now which, if you're looking to put funding in place with a, a short-term time scale, so say somewhere between two and four years, you're going to find that interest rates are higher potentially than what they look like over a longer-term horizon. And so there is a question that you need to ask as a company now: you know, would it make sense for me to lock in such a high rate? Is it true that I only need funding for actually this two or three-year period? And that's a bit of an inversion from where we normally see challenges on this, because of course. Where tax authorities normally go is you, you, know, you put get in place for 10 years that's a higher interest rate you know, why did you not look for shorter term debt and we've got a slightly different dynamic right now so that's a pressure point i think credit ratings we've talked about as well so in this current environment what is the credit profile for companies will they be negatively impacted by the current economic environment or are they likely to be and how would that impact subsidiaries and, and, and should we take that to, into account and i guess linked with that we look at, oh, I was thinking about it there as a, from a standalone credit rating perspective, but of course, per the OECD guidelines, and we know a lot of territories are following that route now, looking at implicit support as well as the standalone approach, you can see a lot more drive then for uh, tax authorities to want to look at a implicit support adjusted credit rating or even using the group credit rating for any borrowing coming into a particular territory. So. That's another area to watch out for is territories pushing really hard for saying, actually, you guys have got the group credit rating over here. You shouldn't be looking at standalone, and really then trying to limit the interest deductions in a particular location. Um, and, and, and maybe one other area to, to think of. So debt capacity as well. Um, I guess in the current environment, we're not hitting recession as of yet, um, as her Alan, as Bob have alluded to. But given that's potentially around the corner again what some of the questions we're start, going to start to get is well maybe you could raise funding and maybe the interest cost would be high over this next two to four year period but could you even get funding based on your financial profile and if you're in a risky industry you might be able to get debt but you might not be able to get as much debt as you might want to get or think you can support using normal market comparables because we're going to be in a very different economic environment yeah 
And you refer to various industries that might be impacted in different manners. In a, a previous podcast, you also talked about the interplay with the ESG profile of borrowers, which also impact your, your debt capacity. So I invite the listeners to uh, tune in on, on that previous podcast on, on the impact of ESG. If we now look forwards and uh, what can we expect from tax authorities and, and what are the expected policy changes? Bob, if you start with, with US. Yeah, thanks, David. So I think one thing, and it's been out there for the last few years as something that we know was supposed to be proposed was um, you know, Treasury giving additional guidance on implicit support. And we still to date have not received anything. I think the latest you know, I, I've heard is that you know, their expectation is that there should be some you know, view of, of thinking about implicit support that you should consider it. But again, that's just based off of you know, things that we've heard, but nothing, no guidance has come out. So I think that's still to be on the watch list. Uh, I think as, as far as no, nothing else major from you know, sort of major tax law policy changes here in the US, I think we have seen, and I'll kind of give maybe more of the America's view. You know, I know in, in Canada, we've seen an uptick in controversy. So I know that there are various cases that are, are getting litigated at this point. Uh, and I know the CRA has been uh, sort of thinking to be very, uh, very focused on financial transactions. On the U.S. side, uh, we've seen some um, not only on the federal side, but just domestic challenges. So we've seen some of the states come in and challenging debt um, and sort of looking at interest rates and debt capacity. Also, and a bit maybe a bit unique to the U.S., but for companies that have issued convertible debt, uh, and I know some of those are being redeemed. Um, there are some special uh, 249 regulations in the U.S., and so um, we, we've seen, especially for companies that issued convertible bonds, maybe even particular with respect to the pandemic, and are now redeeming them. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, there's a part of uh, the bond repurchase premium that uh, potentially is deductible, and so that that has a transfer pricing angle, and so we've seen a number. Of, of those come through that we're, we're analyzing. So for taxpayers that have convertible debt that are being redeemed, they should maybe take a look at that. Um, and then lastly, I think what we're seeing is just pillar two. Um, I think a lot of US companies and, and people were waiting and seeing if it was gonna happen. And I think now um, with a number of countries saying that they were gonna go ahead and adopt, you know, I think that this has become more prevalent and, and companies are looking at sort of the impacts of pillar two and you know which also has a, a a financing angle so i think we've been kind of looking and talking to companies about their financing structures and evaluating some of the potential impacts and things that they'll need to consider so those are some of the considerations i think at a high level from from the us and america side you you mentioned two pillar two and i know in the us with the whole interplay with guilty that's quite some debate but i think it's fair to say that Pillar will uh, come at least in a, a big part of the world. Uh, in the European Union, uh, first directive has been adopted, so it's it will be there. Um, you also referred to this uh, implicit support guidance that will come. Uh, I recall vaguely that you uh, said the same thing last year. So there, I know that the U.S. authorities are taking a bit more time for that guidance, but I think guidance would be uh, welcome uh, in that sense. Then. If we focus on, on EMEA and Europe in, in particular, uh, are there some things that happened last year that we should take into account this year? Yeah, perhaps a couple of things just to touch on, and actually on a related theme. So um, we had a release of the Dutch decree last year, um, which I think we covered in or mentioned in one of the prior podcasts, but effectively this was a nod towards the, the guidance provided by the OECD and, and the reference to financial control over risk effectively imposing a deviation from what was the prior um, setup within um, the Netherlands, which was essentially to say we look at the amounts for an intermediary or on lending type transaction, we look at the amounts being um, pushed through, we look at the risks associated with those amounts, and then we price the transaction according to that. Whereas now there's a much, much stronger focus on the ability to control the risks associated with the transaction, um, both from a financial but also from a substance perspective as well. Um, so that that's a very big push and a big nod towards the OECD, as I say, and a, it's also a bit of a deviation from what was more of a quantitative type assessment as to the type of return you should be leaving for an intermediary type company. I guess linked with that, so in the UK we had um, a, the BlackRock case, uh, which was quite a significant case in the UK. Um, the, the essence of that case was simply that um, looking at a 
financial transaction, but where there was a, a relatively limited degree of control for the borrower over their income stream, what might a lender have expected by way of terms and conditions in that situation to allow them to have the control um, over the borrower in the situations that you might normally expect? Now, of course, that, that case um, it was the initial ruling, so that may well be appealed. It's not a final decision by any means as such yet. But I guess both of these elements are pointers towards where the OECD generally were heading from you know, the chapter 10 perspective, which was you need to be able to evidence there is substance and control over key financial related decisions. And that is both from a borrower's perspective um, and the lender's perspective. Um, and, and both the Dutch and the, the BlackRock cases point to that, that control over risk. Yep. And, and I know the Dutch uh, authorities were very active when drafting chapter 10. So it's not really surprising. They're also a forerunner in the actual application of, uh, of this. Um, and yeah, as you referred to the Dutch degree, you referred to the uh, UK case law. Uh, I note it's both uh, on control of a risk. Uh, in UK case, it's a bit more, it goes further. It's like the control of risk that the bank uh, is expected to have uh, on the transaction. Uh, so th this, is, this is likely a landmark case that we should uh, follow up on. Um, yeah, and also as a uh, kind of overall uh, overall conclusion on substance, it's it's not about only about uh, having people in a certain location. It's about what these people are actually doing, what's in the contract, the tools they have to actually intervene and the like. Great, okay. Hero. Uh, if you go to uh, Australia and and to the wider Asia Pacific. Thanks, David. And so I think if we if we look at the Asia Pacific region, and it, it has always been, a, I guess, a fairly challenging region, because you've got quite significantly different sort of approaches and, and regulations across various jurisdictions um, within in within the region. And we've seen that continue to play out over the last year in terms of some key regulatory changes with certain jurisdictions in the region bringing in new rules, which more closely aligned to generally accepted principles in, in Chapter 10 of the OECD guidelines, while at the same time we've seen a number of jurisdictions continue to strongly enforce some of the unilateral measures that have been implemented in their, their local jurisdictions and, and legislation. So if, if I turn to specifics, in, in 2022 we saw both Japan and Singapore bring in new transfer pricing rules and regulations um, specific to intercompany financing arrangements, which align quite closely to the Chapter 10 guidance and represent a, a fairly substantial shift in terms of the way companies are sort of approaching pricing into company financing in some of those jurisdictions away from more prescriptive or safe harbor based type approaches. Um, in contrast, we're continuing to see some of the key jurisdictions in the region, Hong Kong with the, the local sourcing and TP applicability rules, as well as New Zealand with the restricted transfer pricing rules continuing to apply their, their local regimes, which are quite divergent or quite different from the general OECD principles. And for example, we've seen New Zealand announce again in, in 2023 that the restricted transfer pricing rules and the documentation and, and application of those rules will continue to be a, a, a strong focus area in their enforcement program for the year. Um, the, the other key development we've seen from an Asia Pacific standpoint is in Australia, we've had the, the government come out and announce a, a pretty fundamental shift in the thin capitalization regime with new rules expected from 1 July 2023, which will move the thin capitalization regime away from a, an asset based threshold towards the OECD type 30% EBITDA interest limitation rule. And so that that will represent a fairly fundamental shift for a number of companies and, and in particular those industries which might have more lumpy profit profiles or um, are more asset intensive. And that will need to be carefully considered given we, we are expecting those rules to come into force from 1 July 2023 and legislation reflecting those rules within the next month. Um, so I think in, in all, David, from an Asia Pacific standpoint, while we are seeing some positive developments in terms of alignment with OECD guidelines and some of the, the sort of rules that would be thought about consistently in, in multinationals as they're setting up their treasury policies, there still needs to be some, some careful consideration from an Asia Pacific standpoint on some of these unilateral measures and, and the focus areas of, of tax authorities within the region. Okay, thanks for all.
So with this, we come uh, to the end of the podcast. Uh, what I retain from the discussion is, yeah, first, we have the impact of rising interest rates. So with same levels of intercompany funding, the tax impact will be much higher than it was before, uh, but also the impact on debt capacity, covenants, credit rating guarantees and, and the like. So something to be uh, uh, look after. Uh, also, the importance of modeling in, in all this uh, to test, amongst others, whether the terms and conditions actually make sense, whether the debt capacity in these uh, changing markets still makes sense, uh, but also to avoid unpleasant surprises if you applied uh, interest limitation rules like the 30% EBITDA that will now uh, we'll also have both in Australia and the US. And finally, uh, we still see unilateral measures popping up, especially in, in Asia. So groups need to do a balancing act between the various unilateral measures on the one hand and then the consistency of a group-wide policy. So with this, I would like to thank the listeners to tune in and the speakers for sharing their insights. And I'm looking forward to our next podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.